Bruce Rosen. Um, so Bruce Rosen um, is director of the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging. He's also vice chair for research in the radiology department. Um, Bruce is a pioneer in brain imaging technology development, otherwise known as brain mapping. Um, he's developed many of the tools and techniques that we're familiar with um, and has advanced these tools into clinical uh, sort of practice as well as in research, trying to use imaging tools, including magnetic resonance imaging, advanced modalities. Um, he was one of the pioneers and you know, first people to do functional MRI here back in the uh, early 90s. Um, 1730s, I think. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, he's also then since um, expanded into multimodality kind of ways of exploring brain structure and function, including positron emission tomography, bringing PET together with MRI, um, looking at functional optical imaging, as well as um, magnetoencephalography. Um, today, he'll be speaking to us about next generation brain observ observatories. What's so special about the MGH? Take it away, Bruce. Sure, thanks, Susie. Uh, great pleasure to be here. Thank you all for showing up physically uh, here. Of course, uh, thanks to the audience uh, listening in, but it's always nice to have a few uh, smiling faces or quizzical looks to uh, help uh, keep me on track. Uh, so uh, I was actually uh, uh, delighted with that uh, uh, short and sweet uh, introduction and focused on uh, uh, the kind of tool building aspects of uh, my own work, because that's what the focus will be on today. I look at this audience and I see uh, amazing uh, neuroscientists, clinicians who have made uh, a great use of these tools, of course, some that have helped build them. Um, but I'd like to introduce you to what's uh, coming down the pike, give you a little introduction as to what we've been doing with some of these unique tools, but then give you a heads up as to uh, what you can expect to see in the near future to get you thinking about how you want to use those tools to answer questions of relevance in your science. And um, let's carry on. Oh, no, that was exactly wrong. Uh, so it didn't take long to screw that up. There we go. There we go. Okay, a uh, little uh, disclosures. Uh, the ones uh, to pay particular attention to. Uh, we do get support from the Siemens Health Engineers, and we'll talk about some uh, technical developments we've done with Siemens. Uh, and that last line, uh, uh, we will be discussing non-FDA approved devices. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing in the world of conflicts, but uh, we're almost exclusively going to be talking about uh, uh, non-FDA approved devices. Okay, so um, here's kind of the basic hypothesis that uh, and, and concept that underlies the purpose of this talk. This is actually uh, a quote from uh, Freeman Dyson, quite a brilliant fellow, who talked about the fact that uh, new directions in science are launched by new tools more often than they are by new concepts. And that's not something we always think about, but uh, I'm going to maintain that he's correct. He goes on to say that the effect of a concept-driven revolution is to explain old things in new ways. Uh, we think about uh, general relativity as the new way to explain gravity, which is kind of a concept that had been uh, around for quite a while, but the effects of a tool-driven revolution is to discover new things that have yet to be explained. Uh, and, uh, you know, peering back into my own background, uh, you know, I, I turned to this gentleman uh, for uh, inspiration. Uh, maybe you don't know him from his uh, picture, but you might now know who I'm talking about. This is, of course, uh, Galileo, who took uh, what at that time was a new instrument, and essentially revolutionized our concept of how we see our place in the universe. It was the first to see sunspots, showing it wasn't just a uniform blue, but it was actually an object, and he could measure the rotation, something that uh, um, we had no clue of before him. Saw craters on the moon, uh, saw that the Milky Way was actually a collection of millions of stars that, again, uh, seemed like just a gaseous nebula before. Uh, and maybe most fundamentally made these critical observations of the moons around Jupiter, uh, the so-called uh, Galilean moons uh, in his uh, honor. Uh, and from that basically uh, blew up the uh, uh, um, geocentric model and uh, ushered in the area of the heliocentric models that Copernicus, of course, had hypothesized uh, his data and his observations of this mini solar system around Jupiter 
really kind of was the last nail in the coffin of uh, uh, Ptolemaic ideas and uh, changed our view uh, of uh, man's place uh, within this universe. Um, now, you don't have to uh, only be looking up to get this vision. Anybody want to uh, call out uh, this gentleman? You know, the curly locks don't give it away. Well, uh, now you know, right? Uh, and, you know, it's quite remarkable. You look at his instrument, they were just single lens microscopes. Um, and he wasn't the first to invent the microscope, but he did manage to somehow design these very tiny lenses in such a way that he was able to take what uh, the previous generation, which could maybe get a factor of 20 magnification and increase that to more than 200. And that then gave him a view of the microscopic world that frankly was uh, invisible before. So whether looking out or looking in, uh, new tools fundamentally led to changes in the way we look at the universe. Uh, but falling back on my uh, astronomy interests and themes, um, uh, how does that translate into today? Uh, of course, in the world of astronomy, uh, we all have heard a lot about uh, the amazing observatories that are all in space, the Hubble, uh, and these others. We'll talk very briefly about them. But the question is, what are our great observatories? Uh, not to look at the outer space, but to look uh, and peer into the brain and understand that. What are we doing that uh, could map uh, onto what the, uh, the people that made these amazing tools uh, show? So we all know about the Hubble. It's uh, now 30 years old. So, you know, what is our Hubble? What's our kind of foundational novel instrument for peering into the brain? Uh, if you go back far enough, you might say MRI was, uh, you know, uh, invented in the early 70s was that. But I would say that uh, 17 is kind of uh, our Hubble. Seven Tesla uh, instrument is kind of the modern equivalent. Here we are, it's uh, 20 years, actually uh, 10 years after the Hubble went up, we finally uh, dug a hole big enough to put in our 17 magnet. And since that time have, you know, made some, you know, really fundamental observations that are changing our view of how the brain is structured, how we study the brain and uh, our understanding of certain human diseases. Uh, Katerina Menor, for example, was one of the pioneers in using 17 to study MS and uh, you know, came to realize that what pathologists had known for many years, that uh, MS was not just a disease of white matter, it was a disease across the brain involved in brain matter and could be characterized and, and differentiated based on its location, that unlike previous tools, we could now characterize that in vivo in living patients and show the relationship between the changes and somewhat independence of the changes in the cortex how that relates to cognitive function relative to the white matter function, how treatments affect co uh, cortical disease uh, versus uh, 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 white matter disease, et cetera. You can't see it, you can't measure it. Now we had a tool to measure it. Colleagues, uh, Steve Stuffelbeam uh, and uh, Andy Cole in neurology studying patients with epilepsy, uh, you know, came to discover that there was just a whole host of patients that were coming that were MR negative or perhaps with uh, equivocal um, uh, lesions that suddenly the 7T answered the question, uh, you know, on the uh, top here, uh, these uh, 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 focal cortical dysplasias and cortical migration abnormalities, the 7T was able to show uh, 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 extension all the way into the ependema. And similarly, it was able to differentiate, for example, uh, in this uh, uh, telangiectasia, lesions that shouldn't be operated on that uh, based on 3T data would seem potentially like operative candidates. That's a lesion you don't want to touch. Good thing to know about it before you uh, get in there. Now, in the way of function, of course, I think most of you at this point have uh, seen this amazing picture from uh, John Palomini, you know, uh, how we can uh, see in the back of your uh, brain and your primary visual cortex what you're looking at, show somebody the letter M, do a little geometric distortion to account for how the brain uh, compensates, and sure enough, uh, you can see that. But colleagues like uh, Roger Tutel and uh, uh, Shaheen Nazar uh, have now taken that to the next level uh, scale, looking uh, not just at uh, map levels, uh, uh, primary visual cortex, primary motor cortex, et cetera, uh, but down to the column level, this Mises scale structure. And 7T really is the key tool to allow us to extend our uh, visualization of the map of the brain down from macro into Mises scale. Roger, of course, was uh, one of the pioneers in studying the cortical co uh, uh, column structure of the brain. Here's a classic uh, picture that he took. Of course, in this case, in a non-human primate, he had to physically flatten the cortex 
Our grad students and other volunteers tend to be a little less excited about that prospect. So clever colleagues like Anders Dale and Bruce Fischel have come up with computational tools to do that. But sure enough, when we do so, we're now able to see the same columnar level structures uh, uh, in the living brain of our patients. Uh, and what are the implications of this? Well, first, of course, we're now able to begin to map the visual hierarchy, not just B1, B2, B3, B4, but actually map how this relates to mesoscopic organization. How do the columnar structures relate to different functions? Previous fMRI studies would show that you would get activation for stereo and motion and color in all of these areas, where the area is all just kind of working in concert. Well, no, as it turns out, when you look in detail, the columnar level structures are interdigitated. Distinct parts of the brain are subserving these distinct functions, even at the level of, uh, uh, of V2 and then all the way up to V4. Um, Shaheen has uh, gone on to actually show what I think is one of the first mesoscopic uh, pathologic studies showing mesoscopic reorganization, in this case, in an amblyopic patient. I have to get that word out. Uh, who is uh, uh, stereo blind, showing that uh, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, those stereo selective columns, which are present in normal vision, just uh, aren't there. Uh, and the uh, motion and color sensitive columns remap onto that area. So the notion that we have this mesoscopic organization and it's dynamic and can change in the setting of pathology, I think again, is something that we just didn't have tools to study in human disease before, today we do. I'll give another example, I think a uh, 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 very interesting and very important one, again, from the work of Roger, working with uh, one of our uh, uh, psychiatry colleagues, uh, Daphne Holt, in this case, looking at uh, notions of personal space. It's a concept I think we're all aware of and during COVID uh, became uh, kind of uh, acutely aware of. Uh, what uh, uh, Roger and Daphne and colleagues were able to show, however, is that within the parietal cortex, now not just primary visual cortex, but within parietal cortex, this same kind of topographic uh, columnar interdigitated structures uh, existed. And they were able to show that, um, that all of these different uh, behavioral features, approach versus withdrawal, uh, looking at things in the near field versus far field, again, uh, had this, which looked like a single part of the brain activating to all of these various tasks, in fact, was distinct mesoscopic areas. And of course, now you have the ability to be able to see how these might change in the setting of uh, neuropsychiatric uh, disorders. Again, kind of using this theme that the 7T allows us to kind of look at higher spatial resolution, has moved other investigators uh, here at the MGH to look uh, and other structures like the brainstem. I see uh, Brian Edlow here. It's a part of the brain he has uh, more than a passing interest in. Not a trivial area to study, right? 170 odd nuclei, 300 subnuclei, tiny little structures, but each one of them uh, has a, a critical function and an abnormality in any one of them, as we'll show in just a second, uh, can be uh, uh, devastating. Uh, so uh, our uh, colleague, uh, Marta uh, Viancardi and, and her colleagues have actually been developing, based on 70 data, a detailed atlas of all the different uh, uh, nuclei, as many as they can measure. Uh, and one by one, they're picking them up, developing them on an atlas and building connectomes. Uh, in this case, a functional connectome using functional resting state data. Uh, in this case, working with a, a colleague uh, uh, in uh, neurology, uh, looking at disruptions of the structural connectome in the brainstem, in this case, in patients with uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, uh, precursor, as uh, many of you know, to Parkinson's disease. So again, being able to see these very fine structures in their detail, how they're connected to other structures, and how that then relates to critical uh, human behavioral uh, abnormalities is just something that we now have a tool to do and frankly didn't before. And for those of you interested, I just want to give a plug to this wonderful uh, Brainstem Navigator uh, toolbox that uh, she's developed. Uh, register and uh, sign up for that. You can go grab that on the recording if you didn't uh, grab the QR code there. Um, also, there are other tiny structures in the brain we're interested in. Uh, uh, many of you, uh, especially uh, on the vascular service, are interested in the ability to see vascular structures. Again, my colleague John Palamini, who's now leading our MGB wide ultra high field effort um, has been taking some uh, beautiful uh, vascular uh, pictures, uh, just uh, really exquisite and very high spatial resolution. Uh, one of the interesting observations, the kind of usual rule of thumb is, you know, as your voxels get smaller, your noise gets bigger, and 
you know, the images become uninterpretable, uh, you know, snowstorms. In fact, in the case of vessels, uh, the smaller the voxels actually yielded higher signal to noise or contrast to noise in this case, because um, you're not partial volume. And so, in fact, Somewhat paradoxically, the smaller he made his voxels, the higher the resolution is, the clearer his pictures of the vasculature were. And he was actually able to use this with colleagues to study um, uh, uh, the ophthalmic arteries uh, and macular degeneration. There was a, a company that had a hypothesis about um, uh, abnormalities in the ophthalmic artery flow that they felt like they could perturb to try to uh, slow down the degenerative process, actually able to show that you could uh, uh, quantify uh, those changes over time, and then indeed you can actually measure uh, blood flow um, quantitatively and show its decrease in time as the uh, degree of uh, degeneration increased. Uh, another element that we can use this high signal to noise of is to begin to look for uh, increasingly high temporal frequencies, uh, uh, oscillatory behaviors. We are uh, anyone doing an EEG thinks about the brain as an oscillatory organ. Uh, indeed, it is uh, oscillatory at many different uh, time scales. Uh, here's the work of Laura Lewis, uh, who showed uh, somewhat surprisingly that uh, fMRI, uh, even though it's limited in its uh, ability to understand neuronal function by this hemodynamic filter, is actually able to keep up to oscillatory uh, uh, behavior uh, much better than we thought. Uh, you know, at slow frequencies, 0.2 hertz, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, five seconds per oscillation, wouldn't be surprising that you can see an fMRI signal. But in fact, all the way up to at least a hertz, so you know, getting uh, close to kind of delta wave frequencies, certainly well into the slow wave frequencies, the kind of frequencies that are highly relevant in altered uh, uh, states of consciousness, certainly in sleep, for example, um, that we can begin to track with our hemodynamic signals uh, these oscillatory behaviors. Now, note that the signal bar here change in signal over here is you know 0 0.2 0 0.3 0 0.4 percent you might think that's small but look at the other scale right at one hertz we're talking about 0 0.01 0 0.02 percent right so add two more zeros if you want to see how big that signal change is so this is not an easy trick to play uh, but it is possible and it's possible when you have the very high sensitivity of high field 70 or in this case 9.4 so Laura is that oops Laura's actually been uh, using this to study how uh, neuronal oscillatory behavior is measured with EEG, relates to the hemodynamic oscillatory signals, and how that then relates to cerebral spinal fluid oscillations during sleep states. And she made this very interesting observation that the, um, that the slow wave uh, uh, electrophysiological signals that have been known for some time are associated with global coordination of hemodynamic signals uh, with time, and that those end up essentially pushing and pulling the CSFs, uh, in this case, uh, through uh, direct measurements uh, uh, within the ventricular system, leading to the notion that there may be, uh, that these uh, oscillatory behaviors during sleep states may be critical to mobilizing CSF within multiple spaces within the brain, and perhaps may be very relevant in terms of washing out that. And we all know, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, there's uh, disruptions of sleep, and the question is, you know, what's the cart and what's the horse? Um, it's an important thing, but of course, you need to be able to study that to pose that as a hypothesis. So other colleagues in our uh, in our group uh, working with uh, John and, uh, uh, and Laura are actually now measuring uh, fluid flows and the vector fields of fluid flows across the entire cortical mantle. Notice again that the size of these velocities, very small, right? 0.1 millimeter, you know, a second. So we have great sensitivity, but now we're able to do so through the cardiac cycle, ultimately can do so in sleep states and other states of uh, altered consciousness, uh, giving us a sense for how um, uh, CSF flow may be altered. And of course, we can then do that in disease states to see whether there's quantitative measures uh, that may uh, relate to disruptions in the clearance of, uh, uh, of various bad things that build up in the brain. Well, um, that's all great. So, uh, you know, 7T has been a remarkable tool, but, you know, it's at the end of the road. It, you know, the Hubble's up there, um, you know, but it's been that way for 30 years. But, you know, we're not uh, resting on our laurels when it comes to uh, 7T. There's more going on, and you're going to have the benefits of that for brain imaging specifically, um, actually exclusively, as it turns out. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about this. 
Uh, there's a uh, kind of a new uh, variation on the theme in high field imaging. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the plans are to actually go to the next generation of uh, 7T. And is there a way to keep clicking while you do yeah. your work? Um, okay, just to highlight that uh, uh, this was a collaborative effort with our colleagues uh, uh, at Berkeley, uh, but uh, all the red marks are our own uh, local colleagues here at the MGH. And the bottom line is all the heavy engineering stuff by us. Um, well, okay, so what's the key to the future of 17? So the question we posed, uh, and it has a precedent that I'll talk about in a little bit is, you know, what can you achieve if you dedicate a system to just imaging brain anatomy and function? Just keep in mind our 7T scanners, like our 3Ts, 1.5s that we have in the hospital, they're whole body boards, right? You can, you can image a shoulder or a knee, not so easily, but you can do so just as well as a brain. What if you design a system just around imaging the brain? Well, it turns out that helps. And of course, the thing you want to start with is this gradient. That's the thing that makes that knocking sound when you go in an MR. That's the thing that does the spatial encoding. So if you want higher spatial resolution, faster uh, imaging, you need a, a bigger, more powerful uh, gradient. Uh, and so in fact, uh, our colleagues, oops, uh, uh, T.S. Davids, Larry Wall, working uh, uh, you know, based on a grant from David Feinberg and the colleagues at Siemens have developed uh, what they call their uh, impulse gradient. Uh, as you see here, the impulse gradient, that's the thing in green. So this is no longer a whole body system. If you want to image the liver, you're going to have to go uh, to our next door bay because uh, you can't do it in this bay. This will go in our so-called bay two, for those of you who are familiar with the bays in Charlestown. Um, but otherwise, pretty much looks like the regular 70. The magnet's the same. Uh, the RF coils, of course, are designed to be improved, but they pretty much look like a, a regular MR. Once the patient's in the scanner, it will feel and look like any other 70, uh, but the performance will be uh, definitely uh, different and significantly better. Um, so here's just a, a recent article uh, published by a number of our colleagues. You can see the senior author, Larry Wald, kind of the senior engineer on this process uh, project. Um, uh, in addition to the gradient, of course, there's also the opportunity to improve other elements of this system. Again, the engineers, uh, um, you know, love this kind of stuff, but, uh, you know, the more channels you can build, a typical clinical system has 32 channels. Back in the day, they used to have eight or even one. Well, now we're up to, uh, you know, more than 100, 128 channels. And what that means is smaller coils, which get more signal, but from small parts of the brain, this is actually a game to uh, really give us unprecedented signal from uh, the cortex. Now, uh, if you look at the pictures, uh, this is uh, kind of the earliest days. Um, you know, not completely amazing. The, the number, 300 micron in plane resolution, is uh, pretty good, right? Um, on the other hand, um, uh, you know, there's still artifacts in the images. There's some work to be done. But this is the technical work that uh, we're doing over the uh, over the next few months before we get this system here at the MGH. So uh, uh, it's not quite what uh, Brian and his colleagues and Bruce Fischel and Andre Vandekauer are able to show at 100 micron resolution. But this is the goal, right? This is the target. And if you look within the striatum, you're beginning to see contrast for these very fine structures. Uh, it may be a little while before we're quite taking this picture um, in vivo. But um, we're gaining on it. And uh, of course, the question will be, how far can we get? We're certainly going to get further than we were able to in the past. Vascular imaging, again, these are the very earliest images that have come from this uh, uh, impulse system, but they're looking pretty good. Uh, these so-called quantitative susceptibility images that allow us to quantify iron content, they're going to be uh, improved with this new system. Uh, and I think one of the uh, really uh, powerful uh, new uh, uh, opportunities for this is the ability to more routinely image not just column level structures the way Roger and colleagues have uh, demonstrated, but also look laminar, look layer by layer within the multi -layer, uh, multiple layers of the human cortex. Here actually showing that the distribution of signal uh, is uh, uh, both variable as a function of uh, cortical depth uh, and quite consistent from one day to the next. So these are reproducible findings. Uh, and now we have the opportunity to be able to see not just is, uh, you know, is this part of the brain activated, but which layer is connected. And of course, because the layers relate to input versus output layers, we may be able to develop from our functional studies a better sense of causality 
not just that these are, are areas involved, but which way information is predominantly communicated between one brain area and another. This will require this, and of course now combine this with the columns, we finally have a true mesoscope of the brain looking at laminar and columnar level organization, something we've never been able to do before. This is something that uh, I think we'll have the opportunity to do with this new system. We're pretty excited, should be coming sometime, we hope by the end of the year. Well, of course, that's not the only observatory we have at our disposal. The Chandra up in space has this unique instrument uh, really designed for high energy events. So what's kind of our equivalent of high energy? Well, here I'll have to uh, point to uh, the Connectome scanner. So uh, we built this uh, uh, one almost a decade ago. Uh, uh, you may get a hint for where this is going. Uh, we, it used to just be the Connectome. Now we call it Connectome 1.0. Uh, but, uh, you know, this system had uh, almost a 10 times improvement in sensitivity. Um, so when I mean high energy, what do I mean? Well, something like 22 megawatts of power required to drive this thing. We finally got a decent return on our indirect cost investment. There's the hospital pays for the electric bills on this. <laughs> and dearly. Um, but, uh, you know, point of reference, something like a, a Los Angeles class nuclear submarine. So uh, this is uh, our equivalent of uh, high energy physics in the world of NMR. So why all this fuss about the gradients? So we talked about it with the 7T, even more important in the setting of the connectome scanner. Well, uh, there's your conventional system. The challenge is if you want to encode these very small motions of microscopic water diffusion, where does it move very far? It moves around a micron you know, a box, a micron square, you know, every millisecond. In 100 milliseconds, it's only going to move 10 microns, you know, about the size of a cell. Um, well, you know, you wait 100 milliseconds, your signal's gone. So, uh, you know, you're just basically plumb out of luck. So the advantage of the high gradients is it allows us to push the time in, get much more signal. Uh, we don't have this T2 decay that we have to worry about. We get higher uh, diffusion resolution, so we can kind of see the direction the water is moving much more precisely, sharper diffusion profiles. It really allows us to interrogate microstructure in a way that you can't when you're taking 100 milliseconds to make your measurement. So Connectome 1.0, I mean, it was a great machine for a variety of purposes. It, it was the ultimate machine for getting on the cover of, uh, of uh, fancy uh, magazines. Dan with Dean, uh, in addition to uh, you know his uh, brilliance and kind of coming up with, uh, he was actually the first to do diffusion tractography. You may not know that, um, but uh, uh, he also had a great artistic eye, and so uh, uh, came up with these amazing pictures. These are canonical at this point, and they grace the cover of uh, of, of uh, music albums and all sorts of things. But when you look at this, one of the uh, ideas that Dan came up with, looking at these closely, is this notion that the brain isn't just kind of random wires going from one place to the other, but it actually has kind of this uh, superstruct, this kind of grid architecture, he calls it. Uh, and so we're really just beginning to understand what the implications of that are. Uh, our colleague, uh, Doug Verzine, working uh, with Van, has then looked microscopically using conventional tracers and showed that indeed, even with a local tracer, if you look deep in the brain, away from where the tracer was located, sure enough, that grid appears. And when you look more closely under the microscope, you realize what you see are branching structures, crossing fibers, turning structures. So it's not just crossing, you know, like uh, the desiccations of, uh, uh, you know, in the brainstem, but it's actually uh, a much more complex uh, view of we think about anatomy. And so maybe the correct way to think about connectivity is more like paths along a grid, um, you know, rather than, uh, you know, kind of a classic view. Uh, I think this is uh, still uh, not fully appreciated what the uh, implications of this are clinically and otherwise, but uh, if you talk to Helen Mayburn, she'll say that the key to successful treatment of uh, her depressed patients with DBS is to hit those crossing fibers, but likely has at least some clinical relevance in some setting. Of course, others have used this uh, high uh, uh, this high spatial and uh, crossing fiber uh, resolution to look at connectivity in the other disease states. Uh, my colleague Brian Edlow has shared this story. I don't have the time to tell the whole story, but the concept here is in a patient who uh, was in a bike accident, uh, had a small a here, had a big lesion. This is not his problem. This little lesion in the critical part of the brain was the problem, and the reason he was in a coma. Patients are wondering, what's he, is he going to recover? The thought was at the time, probably not. Turned out, you know, he recovered almost fully, beautifully. Well, you know, um, 
When you look now with the 17 scanner, you can see an exquisite view of the brainstem, but notice that the lesion is actually kind of orthogonal to the uh, peduncular uh, uh, nucleus, uh, and thus the fibers that go through that nucleus are largely intact. So perhaps if we had known that at the time, we could have made predictions that this patient did have enough intact fibers that he would regain consciousness, as was the case. And Brian, of course, and his colleagues are in the process of looking uh, through uh, patient data to be able to try to understand who recovers and who doesn't uh, essentially map out personalized connectomes of patients with these uh, potentially devastating uh, deep brain uh, brainstem lesions. Uh, just another example I wanted to show uh, that I get very excited about when I think about the uh, um, the opportunities that uh, diffusion microstructure imaging at Fortis. Um, this actually uh, was inspired by work of Leonardo Cohen down at the NIH, who actually showed um, that, uh, you know, I think this is the key point in this, that these online motor skill learning, you know, learn to play a sequence on a keyboard, you know, that many of the games largely occur during periods of rest. It's not when you're practicing, it's when you stop practicing that you actually get that improvement in performance. Um, first, we're very interested to understand why that is, how that happens. So uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Jacobacci et al. Uh, published uh, uh, not too long ago in PNAS that in fact, you can design fMRI tests that will see kind of conventional activation areas more active during the cast tasks, no surprise, motor function, pretty much uh, see what you would expect to see. But sure enough, during the rest period, you would also see areas of increased activation, but distinct areas. Um, and what she was, uh, uh, what they were able to show was that in fact, not only would you see increase in function, which you might think are associated with maybe replay of that learning process, but actually there were microstructural changes, changes in the diffusion signal that almost exactly overlapped the areas that they saw functional signals in. So uh, Susie Huang, uh, working uh, with her uh, colleague uh, from the uh, University of uh, Buenos Aires, actually replicated this study on the connectome with much higher sensitivity. Indeed, it was uh, uh, quite a, a robust result, but even more uh, interesting, I think, in uh, future tense, they then applied the uh, ability of the connectome to be able to look uh, in greater microstructural specificity using the so-called SANDY technique or SOMA and neurite density imaging to actually map out a whole series of features uh, that also showed not just changes after a day, but changes after 30 minutes. So what's happening structurally within the brain within minutes of these uh, learning functions? I think we're really in a position where we don't know, but we now have the tools to be able to allow us to investigate these things. But again, as you can see, these are small signals really kind of at the, the margin of uh, our ability to see them. And this, of course, prompted the following, uh, you know, thing, you know, please, could we have some more? Um, and the answer is, yes, we can, thanks to Susie Huang and uh, many of her uh, hardworking challenges. Uh, uh, 1.0 has now led to Connectome 2.0. This is the next generation scanner really focused on uh, bridging the micro scale to the macro scale through these mesoscale uh, measurements. Um, so why uh, uh, 2.0? Well, we needed even more gradient strength and faster changes in the gradient to achieve even shorter diffusion times and probe micron size uh, structures. Uh, the longer you take, the more blurry that signal is and uh, you lose the ability to see small things like small axons. Um, we also, of course, would like to validate what it is we're seeing with these diffusion signals. So uh, Susie built this in and collaborations with Jeff Lickman. I think you heard about this with uh, Anastasia's talk recently. Uh, and this will really allow us to kind of push the limit. So here's the Connectome 2.0. We want you all to be using this. So knock on uh, Susie's door. Um, uh, it's, it's a beautiful looking scanner. Uh, it also, like uh, that impulse gradient, is a dedicated head system. So you don't have to worry about the gastroenterologists or cardiologists, right? They're not going to be in the room uh, unless they're interested in studying the brain, which surprisingly they often are. Um, but uh, you guys have this to your uh, as your own playground. Uh, it's really an amazing uh, system, uh, an even more sophisticated gradient, again, designed by Matthias Davids and uh, Larry Wald and colleagues, uh, built by our colleagues at Siemens. Um, uh, really uh, an amazing, impressive uh, uh, technical achievement. Its gradient strength is almost twice what the Connecto 1 is. The slew rate is three times faster. Um, 
there's just a, you know, kind of the spec sheet. So, you know, kind of four times more oomph, if you will, that product of those two, um, you know, lots of volts, lots of amps, you know, uh, you don't want to spill a cup of coffee uh, in the back room, um, but, uh, you know, a, a lot of amazing things you can see. One of the challenges, of course, when you think about, you know, what's a gradient? A gradient is a change in magnetic field. You need to turn it on and turn it off to play these diffusion games. Well, you know, how is it that we do TMS? Transcutaneous magnetic stimulation, we take a magnetic field, we turn it on, we turn it off rapidly. Guess what happens? The brain activates. Well, so nerves activate in the setting of the electric fields that get generated by changes in DBDT, and that's Maxwell's equations. So at some point, it's not the technology, but it's actually the biology that begins to limit how far we can press these systems. And indeed, that's the case with the connectome. What uh, Larry and Matthias Davids in particular worked out was that if you take a conventional gradient design, you let our you know, very skilled and clever uh, Siemens engineers build a gradient along the patterns that they're used to, that the system very quickly generates peripheral nerve stimulation. The good news is it's not the brain that activates, it's actually the peripheral nerves. And you know, that's a little less scary, but you know, you feel it. And at some point the patients will feel it to the point where they're gonna say, stop. So you really like to find ways to mitigate that peripheral nerve stimulation. And what these guys have uh, went to discover is first that they could build very detailed biophysical models that could accurately predict the stimulation. And even more important, they could then redesign the gradient, twist where the wires go in such a way to still get the same performance, but do so without stimulating the nerves. And they actually did that, very, very uh, clever experiment, and got to the point where they were actually able to get, you know, somewhere between, you know, two and a half and, uh, you know, more than four times greater peripheral nerve stimulation compared to the connective, which means you can get you know, kind of much higher on this performance curve than you possibly could on Connectome uh, 1.0. Basically, it means you can take even more advantage of this high power and kind of push off that biological limit. I'm not sure that we've really uh, taken that uh, to the ultimate, but uh, it's been a really important technical advance that came from detailed modeling, but with a real world implication for you and the experiments you do. But there was another little kind of side twist from all this very detailed modeling. And this is the work of Valerie Klein and her colleagues who basically said, okay, well, now we know how to build these models to uh, avoid peripheral nerve stimulation. We can also build models to maybe direct peripheral nerve stimulation. In this case, uh, she was interested in spinal cord stimulation. So now we have these detailed nerve models. We can design our coils. We can predict accurately where the stimulation thresholds are and then ultimately uh, direct them. So the notion here is that perhaps we can specially build design and uh, paradigms to directly stimulate and activate the spinal curve versus peripheral nerves. Uh, uh, we could target dorsal versus ventral, um, uh, really uh, quantify uh, the uh, stimulation. And so she's actually now building these detailed models that show that we can more selectively target, for example, ventral motor nerves uh, than simple electrodes can. And this may mean that we have the ability with uh, non-invasive uh, uh, stimulation methods to do as well as some of the really nice results that are coming out using uh, uh, implanted electrode work in terms of the improvements in uh, motor function uh, following spinal cord injury. It's a really interesting uh, kind of spin-off of this uh, very clever uh, you know, biophysics studies. Of course, like uh, with the 7T, you got to build clever coils. Our colleague, Boris, uh, Akil, uh, former colleague of ours, uh, now over in Germany, has built these really elegant coils, both for in vivo imaging and for ex vivo imaging. So, Matt, I'm looking at you. Uh, it's probably, it's, it's not your brain, I was going to say, but it's a brain we may have gotten from you, um, uh, you know, sitting uh, in that bucket. But, you know, think about how you could use this uh, amazing tool uh, for your own uh, uh, purposes. Uh, don't look uh, too closely at the uh, relative lack of uh, uh, cortical, um, you know, uh, activity in this particular brain, uh, but you can see that even at these uh, very high uh, B values, uh, which is you know, very strong gradients, uh, we still get signal on the old scanner. We, we just wouldn't see anything at these uh, very high values, and yet you can still see this mapping, which basically means that we can now uh, do in uh, multiple subjects uh, and single subjects what we can do otherwise. So on connectome one, if you wanted to say make maps of axonal size using detailed microstructural measures, as Susie showed, 
Uh, you can't really see very much in one person. Uh, if you do 20 people, well, now you can see kind of the distribution of sizes that you would uh, expect to see. Here's a single subject with connectome 2, and you can see that same pattern. So now we're getting to the point where we have a sensitivity where we can do this on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, not just on kind of large group averages. Uh, I think Anastasia and Dickey may have shown this the other day, just the ability to use the scanner to get even higher spatial resolution for connectivity work. And you heard her uh, give her talk about her large-scale imaging of neural circuits. I won't uh, repeat that, except it's a very ambitious agenda, uh, no doubt at least a 10-year project to kind of map every axonal projectome uh, in a human brain. Uh, but uh, having this bridging technology to go from the macro to the micro scale uh, is going to be essential to it. Again, think about what you can use that tool. Um, yeah. Finally, uh, let me uh, give uh, kind of the third of my, uh, you know, kind of three uh, major uh, observatories, if you will, off in space. There's the Spitzer Space Telescope. It's an infrared uh, telescope. Uh, why do we care about the infrared? Well, in the infrared, we have great molecular sensitivity and specificity. Uh, our equivalent for that is our tools to bring PET imaging together with MRI. Now, PET, of course, as you know, is a remarkable uh, tool. It has exquisite sensitivity, a wide array of neurochemical processes, all sorts of, but basically anything that has a carbon in it, you can potentially label with PET and see its distribution. It does have its limitations, however, um, in particular, its lower spatial resolution. MR, of course, high spatial resolution, it gives you good physiology, uh, not so sensitive, uh, hard to quantify. Uh, really, if you can get the best of both worlds, you've got a remarkable device. And for the last decade or so, our colleague Chipper and Quintana uh, and uh, many others have been using this tool uh, in very, uh, very interesting ways. Again, I, there are many, many examples I could pull from. I'll just pull from a recent uh, uh, article that Marco Loggio's group did here. He was looking at uh, combined metrics of infl brain inflammation, one using a, a PET tracer, PBR28, so-called TSBO agent, which is associated with microglial activation, though not totally specifically. Uh, also, at the same time, doing magnetic resonance spectroscopy, looking at a myelin inositol signal, which again is supposed to be a, a, a glial marker, uh, showing, in fact, these are increased uh, in patients, uh, you know, during the pandemic, but in non-infected individuals. So, if you have any questions about whether the, uh, you know, the pandemic was uh, good for our brains or not, um, short answer: apparently, it wasn't. Uh, 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 whether you got COVID or not, uh, you did not escape, uh, you know, unharmed. Um, now, um, you know, many, many other examples, but I'll give one other example that I think is really kind of driving the next generation of tools. And this is an example from Kristen Sanders, again, using today's tools, where she's been studying how the brain reacts both functionally and pharmacologically to different drug challenges. So she's looking, for example, at uh, the relationship between uh, how agonists, uh, D2, D3 agonists, uh, uh, change the brain and how antagonists do. Um, sure enough, uh, if you have an antagonist, as you give more of the uh, uh, cold mass, you displace the hot mass, you get a, a, a positive uh, CBV signal, you're removing the inhibitory uh, activity of the D2, D3 receptors. Give an agonist just the opposite, that you also displace the um, uh, the tracer, uh, but here you get a negative CVV response. Um, and so you can actually map this out as a function of the occupancy and make precise maps of occupancy versus function, the CVV being a surrogate for neuronal function through our usual hemodynamic response, throw a tiny little bit of math at it, um, and you can actually measure baseline occupancy, something that we have no way to measure. And of course, we would expect to be quite different in psychiatric disorders, substance use disorders, but with no uh, really credible way of measuring this, now we suddenly have a way to measure this because we can simultaneously measure the effects of the drug on the receptor and the effects on the networks uh, in the brain. She was also looking at the differences in the temporal response between how the receptors uptake um, that we can measure uh, with PET and how the functional response that we measure with MR showing that in, uh, uh, an antagonist to see kind of a classical you know, occupation model and direct relationship between uh, occupancy and the functional response, uh, but a very divergent uh, response when we look at uh, agonists, which suggests 
internalization. And indeed, she was able to do detailed modeling of this divergence and from that actually measure the rate of internalization and desensitization of the receptors, coming up with numbers that actually very closely matched uh, uh, ex vivo measurements. There was really no way to measure this in vivo before. Now we have a way to measure it. So think about what that might be able to tell you about underlying receptor function, how it changes in the face of genetic abnormalities, et cetera. Um, finally, uh, you know, we're beginning to do uh, more studies uh, looking at kind of dynamics of metabolism. We're used to seeing dynamics in terms of uh, brain function, but that doesn't include the metabolic measures that we can measure with PET. Something as simple as FDG, for example, it turns out with clever work that uh, Jacob Booker and Marjorie Million did, uh, actually were uh, able to create kind of a new paradigm, something they called FPET, um, where they actually can uh, not just see FDG uptake in the brain, that will give you a static measurement of metabolism, but actually can measure dynamically how pet metabolism changes with time and can do so in the setting of a functional activation, the same way we can look at the hemodynamic changes that we normally do with fMRI. And indeed, because we have scanners that have both, we can actually directly measure uh, functional activity as a function of, uh, uh, of a neuronal uh, stimulus for metabolism, blood flow, blood oxygen level dependence, so an oxygenation sensitive measure, um, all uh, simultaneously. So this is great if you're interested in basic metabolism, perhaps uh, deficits in mitochondrial function that may uh, uh, change uh, uh, glucose metabolism. But something that I think would be even cooler is to be able to do this for neuroreceptor function. Can we make dynamic maps of changing neuroreceptor uh, uh, function, um, not static maps of dopamine, but dynamic maps of how dopamine is turning on and off in the face of uh, uh, brain stimuli? Turns out those signals are really small. Seems like it should be possible, hard to do. So what do you need to do? You need to build a better tool uh, and our uh, colleague at Chipper and Quintana with uh, his colleagues are actually designing a very cool uh, new scanner that's basically designed to kind of, again, bring every modern tool kind of to bear in all directions. Uh, it's so-called, uh, you know, uh, human dynamic neurochemical connectome scanner. Uh, so just look at it. It doesn't look like any PET scanner. It doesn't look like any scanner you've seen before. Right? Instead of just kind of a cylinder you stick your head in, it's you know, more like the bathosphere that you put your head in, right? And there's a reason for that. Um, uh, you're collecting essentially all the photons that are coming out uh, and that greatly increases your sensitivity. And uh, of course, he's also building it to be compatible not with 3T, the way our current MR pets are, but with 7T. So we get all the benefits we talked about with that, that first set of the talk, um, but um, uh, with this very, very sensitive uh, pet camera, so, um, you know, you have to have high detector efficiency and there are various technical games. Like you, you want to be able to see along the line where the photon was emitted by being able to tell the difference. Well, it arrived here versus there. Well, light travels pretty fast. There's not a lot of difference in time between it being emitted here versus there. So, uh, but you can do it uh, if you really work hard at the engineering and uh, Chipriot is in the process of doing that. It's great. The solid angle coverage with the spherical design, um, that's a big number. Um, uh, and uh, then, you know, stick it and make it all work in a 70 scanner, you know, good luck. Um, you know, lots of hard things to do. You got to get a lot of electronics to work in a very uh, small space. Um, you have to build RF coils and all the rest of it to work inside the small space. Um, you know, it's extremely challenging, but the result is, that, uh, you know, if this is kind of the traditional metrics for our kind of standard scanners, notice that the uh, uh, spatial resolution of this camera should be uh, better than twice that of our existing cameras. But even more important, the, um, uh, the sensitivity of the camera is, should be at least an order of magnitude greater. So think about what that means. If we have our limited by radiation dose, to say getting a, a single injection, now we could give 10 injections, 10 different compounds, repeat an experiment 10 times, maybe do younger uh, adults, even children, uh, because the doses now are kind of getting very close to like the dose you would get taking a transatlantic uh, flight. Um, uh, should be uh, really very, very powerful. So uh, is that all I got?
just these three things? No, of course not. We're doing lots of cool things. So, you know, handheld MRI, yes. Or it's the coolest uh, building. Okay, it's a little, you have to be a strong, you know, it's like an art. It's the Schwarzenegger kind of handheld at this point. Uh, but, uh, you know, small little device, that could be, that is an MR scanner. It's being built as we speak. Magnetic particle imaging, a whole new thing. We can give a whole talk just on that. It's, it has the word magnet in it. It's nothing like MR. Uh, and has interesting features kind of, again, living in the space between MR and PET. Uh, combined optical, optically pumped magnetometer mag, magnetoencephalography with array transcranial magnetic stimulation or arrays of TMS combined with MRI. Happening, happening, happening. Here's uh, this uh, combined OPM and MEG and the uh, combined array TMS um, uh, with MRI with simultaneous EEG while we're at it. Let's just do that too. No problem. This is being built by uh, uh, Lucia Navarro, Apel uh, Newman, uh, Yoshio Okada, and Pat Bell. A uh, very cool and interesting novel technology if you want to bridge electrophysiology with, uh, uh, with spatial mapping and stimulation, targeted stimulation. Finally, a portable optical CBF quantification. You know, I, we could be looking at your dream centers now and seeing how they're being activated during this talk, uh, you know, in real time, that's, uh, that's upcoming. So, okay, if, uh, you know, if the 70s are uh, Hubble, then, you know, what's our web, right? Hubble was cool, but we've gone through. Well, next step for us is probably yet another doublet, right? So, you know, 70 MR, it's you know, more than twice seven. Um, uh, performance, size, and definitely more than twice in terms of its cost. The, the rule of thumb is it's a million dollars at Tesla. No way you're building a 14T scanner for $14 million. That'd be a bargain. Uh, but, you know, you can see that as you look at the signal and noise, you know, deep in the brain, it becomes very, like, highly nonlinear. So to go from 7 to 14, you've got, like, a factor of 4 improvement for those interested in the brain stem. You know, at the cortex, it's, like, off the charts. And just an enormous amount of potential signal. Uh, now, it has another problem. <laughs> it's big, right? This is the 11.7. Uh, and you can see how big that is. And imagine scaling that up. So uh, um, it's not a small job. But, you know, the bottom line is somebody's already got a bunch of money. Uh, I don't think it's going to be enough. I think they're smart. They're going to take the money and then they're going to go back and ask for more when it's half built. And he's going to want to... You know, it's, it's like like the big dig, right? You got a big hole in the ground, you got to fill it in. And, you know, okay, so it's not $10 billion, it's $100 billion. No, no problem. Uh, it's going to cost them 50 But fine, they're doing it. Uh, they're getting started. So if we're going to do this, we better get cracking. So, you know, that's, that's our charge. Uh, I, don't give up hope, but, uh, you know, prepare to live long and prosper. It may take a little while to get there. Well, okay, so I'm wrapping up now. Um, uh, with a kind of, this is my final kind of encouraging charge to you folks. Go back to astronomy, right? The greatest telescope maker of all time, one could argue, is uh, George Ellery Hale. He built the largest refracting telescope, still the largest refracting telescope in the world, the 60-inch at Yerkes. Moved to reflectors, built the 100-inch uh, at Mount Wilson, and uh, the Hale telescope named it uh, in his honor, the 200-inch at the uh, Palomar Observatory. By today's standards, uh, seems small, but not small at all. And he made some important and interesting observations, but it wasn't Hale, the telescope builder, that fundamentally used the tool to change our view of the universe. It's another fellow, this guy, Edward Hubble. We know Hubble. We've heard that name before. And if you wondered why the Hubble was named after Hubble, wonder no longer. He was the guy that made this graph, made these measurements. He understood that there were certain stars that had a very clear relationship between their change in light intensity and how bright they were. And so he could use them as so-called standard candles to measure distance. You can measure the periodicity, just take images night after night, say, oh, this one takes 10 days to go through its cycle, this one takes 20, I know how bright it is, I see how bright it looks to me, that tells me how far away it is. And oh, if you have a big enough telescope, you can do that not only within the stars of our galaxy, but you could do that in stars in other galaxies. Back then, they didn't even know that other galaxies were like other galaxies. Some people thought they were nebulae, but no, they proved that they were other galaxies. And he showed this relationship, which basically showed that the further away they were, he used with this method, 
And then he could measure how fast they were receding using the Doppler effect. We all know that. And showed that there was this great linear relationship. The further away things were, the further away they were traveling away from us, i.e. the universe was expanding. It's kind of imagine the raisins in a muffin and the muffin is growing up. Every raisin is getting further away from the others. The further away they are, the faster they seem to be moving. It told us that the universe was not static. That was the conventional view. So much so that Einstein, when he wrote his uh, um, uh, general relativity equations, added in an extra boost. His equations told him that the universe must be expanding. He said, that can't be right. And he added in this fudge factor, which he later said was like the biggest mistake in his life, right? Just because everybody knew the universe was static. Well, no, it wasn't static, right? We live in this expanding universe and it was Hubble that did that. So in this audience here, somebody is going to use one of these tools to make some amazing discovery, hopefully more than one. Uh, and I very much encourage you to come talk to me, talk to Susie, talk to Roger. You know, many friends uh, are, uh, are here. Uh, others uh, need to be friends. So come and think about how you want to use these tools to study uh, the human brain. And by the way, I didn't even talk about the fact that we can do the same studies in mice, do translational studies, et cetera. Okay, with that, I am finally done. Thanks uh, not only to the many people that I shouted out to, uh, but to uh, the people that uh, responded to my desperate call, I did find out that this talk, which in my calendar was scheduled for a week from today, was actually today. I found that out last Friday, so you can imagine how joyful everyone was when they got an email from me. Please send me some slides. But this weekend, uh, they did. These people answered the call, so we thank them for that, and I thank you all for your attention.